So what's that one? That one is tetanus diphtheria polio. Yeah. This one is hepatitis A and typhoid. Okay. okay. After 10 years celebrating the homes of Britain, I'm now going to India's largest slum. Darovi looks like a hellhole. Disease is rife, water's contaminated, and sanitation is rudimentary. But it's also claimed that this slum has got a strong sense of community, high employment, and little crime. Architects, planners, and even Prince Charles are convinced that Darrowvie has got what we lack. I strongly believe that the West has much to learn from societies and places which, while sometimes poorer in material terms, are in many senses infinitely richer in the ways in which they live and organize themselves as communities. We don't see him uh, selling Highgrove and buying a slum in Mumbai. I mean, it's, it smacks slightly, doesn't it, of hypocrisy. <laughs> As billions crowd into the world's cities, they say we should all be looking to Darovi as a model for sustainable living. These are the cities of the future. When I think of a slum, the thing I think about is, is misery, in a way. Yeah, everybody's saying that these people are not miserable, that they are intensely happy. I don't buy that. I'm going to see for myself if this place can in any way be the answer to anyone's problems. So, I'm planning to spend two weeks in Darby, eating, sleeping, and, well, you know. It's the last place on earth I'd think to search for answers. You expect to see, don't you, above that bridge a sign as at the entrance to Hades in Dante's Inferno. It said, abandon hope all ye who enter. This is my first time in India, ever. It's also my last night in luxury comfort before I enter the slum. Good evening. Hi. For the next two weeks, I'm planning on living in Darabi. Mumbai is one of the world's mega cities racing into the future and building up into the sky. Property here is among the most expensive in the world. This 27-storey skyscraper will be the private home for just one family, and it's costing $2 billion to build. And yet, sitting right in the middle of this modern metropolis is the patchwork of shanties that is Darabi, India's largest slum. So this is it. Thank you. Here, nearly a million people are crammed into just one square mile. I'm hoping to uncover the secrets of this place and see if it really can reveal ways that we should all be living. Oh, my goodness. Someone living there. A oh, guy having a slash on the bridge, but then, you know, who wouldn't when caught in need? At the very edge of Darovi is where the latest arrivals come to make their home, under the bridge where the water pipes from the city meet the slum. There's a swamp down there, look. And those... The houses here are so camouflaged, you don't even see them at first. You think it's more piles of rubbish, but look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight dwellings down there. Look at it. The smell is, is awful. And this is people living in a cesspit, isn't it? Rajesh, yeah. Kevin, how are you? Fine. Pleased to meet you. Wow, I'm just, I'm just uh, get, getting a little bit shocked, a little bit, you know, kind of <laughs> overwhelmed by what I'm seeing here. You know, it's, it's okay. very powerful, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> very powerful. My guide, Rajesh, has agreed to help me get into the heart of Darovi. It's a no-go zone for foreigners like me. As a lifelong slum dweller, 
Rajesh is connected. He can open doors. Just watch, you don't slip. I'll watch, yeah, I'll be very careful on this, yeah. It's really hard to believe, Rajesh, that people live here. Yeah. Even in the rainy season, they, you will find them here. Really? But in the rainy season, it really rains, doesn't it? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's non-stop for weeks. Non-stop. And they just live under, they're just there. Yeah. What's this goo here running? All the wastage water coming from all parts. No sewage, really. See, the children, they're not afraid. They're standing no, there. No, no, I noticed that. They're just, they're happy to play. And occasionally, their kite sort of drops in it, and they <laughs> just fish it out again. Yeah. <laughs> This is a boy over there just having a crap on the sidewalk. He's taking his time over it. He's having a really good long one. <laughs> do you accept this as normal, as part of your life? Yeah, absolutely. Because you've grown up with this. But do you accept it as right? Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah, it's right. Because you don't have other type of living. It's quite alarming that these children are playing on this bridge. Below them is this kind of toxic, leaching waste. God knows what in this. Yeah, everything is there. It's yeah. very dangerous, but they are not afraid of all this. No, they're just so happily just leaping up there like a climbing frame. It's not good, is it? You see, that rat doesn't look particularly healthy to me. Nor would it be living on that. <laughs> Heading further into the slum, the water pipe disappears under a mountain of rubbish. With no permissions, no plan, and no permanent rights, the people of Daravi have built themselves an entire city on top of a rubbish tip. Oh, Christ. What's this? This is, this is a kind of toxic sludge. Chemicals, water, drainage, sanitation, all is inside this. What, what's, that, what's that pipe? What's that pipe that pipes goes to the house. Is it's that a water pipe? pipe? Yeah, water pipe. That's a water pipe sitting in a pond yes, a of toxic pipe. sludge. How deep is that? Uh, maybe not half a meter. Oh, That's good God. Not more than that. Excuse us. There's a lot of human shit around, isn't there? There's a lot of crap. Um, do you know what I, what I find more disturbing than that, though, is the, is the chemical stuff here as well. It's the fact, you know, I mean, human shit is human shit. And frankly, in a city in India a thousand years ago or in medieval England, you'd find that in the streets. What you wouldn't find is toxic compounds, you know, of heavy metals. Daravi is not one place. There are dozens of distinct neighborhoods negotiated by a mind-boggling maze of lanes. With no maps, road signs, no guidebooks to help me, Rajesh is the key to getting me into this vast labyrinth. Can you just watch your head? Are yeah, for the case of the wires, yeah. Just as the edges of Deravi are marked by temporary shacks, poles and tarpaulins, so its more established heart is more permanent. There are organised rows of solid buildings. Oh, the stench. After two hours walking, I've no idea where I am. But we've arrived in an area called the transit camp. Here, Rajesh offers me a bed for my first night in the slum. The way we are going now, it's it's uh, near my house. So a lot of people have television, I see. Without that, there is no entertainment because we don't have a uh, club or pub. So TV is the main entertainment. This is the place where I live. We're here. Yeah. Exciting. Come sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just watch your head. Yeah, I'll watch my head on the fan because otherwise I would decapitate myself <laughs> or at best give myself a haircut. Hello. How are you? my mother. Pleased to meet you. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. The worrying thing, really, now is that if I were to get up now and walk out onto the street and try and find my way anywhere, I, I don't know what... I don't have a map. I, ha, I don't know what this place looks like. I've never been here. I couldn't get out. 
But here, I feel very welcomed. Welcomed into something extremely strange. But welcome nonetheless. I'm in India on a journey into the heart of Dharavi, perhaps the world's most extraordinary slum. It's not a place where outsiders are normally allowed to stay. My passport in is Rajesh, and for my first night in the slum, I'm staying with him. He shares his 12 by 12 foot home with his extended family, his mum, his sister, her husband and their two kids. Hello. Hi. Oh, fantastic. Many of the world's leading architects and planners claim this slum as having solved some of the problems facing our cities. I can taste them all. <laughs> it's a series of hits, uh, punches you four, four or five times, one after the other. So I've come here for two weeks to try to make sense of it. Where London, where England and where you are now, Kevin? I, I'm in bed, that's where I am. <laughs> that's, that's all I finally care about. <laughs> I shared the upstairs room last night, sleeping on the floor. How did you sleep? I slept really well. Um, really quiet. That was really surprising. Day here starts early. There isn't enough water for Mumbai's 60 million residents. So, in the slums, water is rationed. Standpipes come on at 5.30 for just two hours. Amazing. <laughs> it's a sea of hose pipes. Rajesh shares his tap with 12 neighboring homes. Everyone has to get enough water now to last till the next morning. It's the, the men are standing around chatting like me, you know. The ladies are carrying the water. Rajesh is trying to get me access to one of the oldest communities in Dharavi, where the slum started over 70 years ago. It's incredibly difficult to get in, but he says it's the best place for me to see how the slum really works. En route, we cross the transit camp again. It's apparent that this is a place that is largely ignored. Rubbish is everywhere, and most areas lack proper sanitation. Mind the dead rats. Just there. Oh, oh, oh. Mind also the pile of shit as well there. Whoa. This is hard to stomach after breakfast. Although there are public latrines, over 500 people share each toilet. That's where corporations come in, isn't it? Corporations and city councils to provide sanitation and rubbish clearance, all the kind of amenities that we kind of human beings need when we live in large communities. Most of the sewers here are open and running through them, improvised fresh water pipes. When they crack, they draw in raw sewage. Kids inevitably play in contaminated water and the result is high levels of diphtheria, TB and typhoid. Doctors here are dealing with an estimated 4,000 cases a day of sickness caused by poor sanitation. I'm excited by the idea that this place is so unplanned and homemade, but despite its reputation, so far I haven't seen much to celebrate. Oh my God, look, 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 this is the um, wash house. <laughs> We've reached the Dobie Gat, or Laundrette, where clothes are first washed and then laid out to dry next door. You go to French villages and see these for central washing areas in Italy too, you know, and you think, oh, how quaint, people would come and wash, and the water's beautiful, it's coming from the mountains, it's crystal clear. This is the sort of the, the flip side of that, isn't it? This is the hellish version of it. This open sewer here is draining into this area here, and they're washing their clothes in there. One thing about Dharavi that architects and planners get excited about is its neighborhood meeting places. But the reality, though social, is also squalid and toxic. 
I'm sorry, but I'd sooner everybody had a washing machine at home. Already, I'm finding this place to be a paradox. Disgust is followed by delight. Around the corner from the toxic wash house is a fantastic, fully functioning high street of small shops, a site that would be treasured back home. You can get everything you need within about 100 yards of where you live. There's the equivalent of Boots the Chemist just here. Look at that. What else? Uh, tubes, pipes, food, clothes, saris. Absolutely fantastic. This is amazing. The street turns into a mosque and everybody's quiet. And now it's turning back into a street. No, what? I'm beginning to see that this place has got something to teach us about the way people use space. Every inch is prized. <laughs> 30 seconds. With a million people packed into a square mile, the Make Do Mosque illustrates how space here is flexible, how it changes with people's needs. Rajesh has guided me to the edge of Kumbawada, the neighborhood he wants me to see. But even he can't get me in. 15 inch TVs. Yeah, 15 inches there. But, but, for, but there. for a community association, you're going to have, there are going to be several people watching. The price of entry? A brand new color television for the community elders. Oh, God, that's huge. How are we going to carry that? Good. Off we go. Rajesh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The plan is, in exchange for the television, the elders will let me into their community and allow me to stay with a family. Kumbawada, the pottery area, may be a fiercely independent place with a distinct distrust of strangers, but it's thriving. Apparently, its people have found ingenious ways to live and work in a very crowded space. I'm looking for the community center. No shooting, no photos. No shooting. Not today. No filming today. It appears the Guardians have changed their minds. Maybe I should have brought them a flat screen. This is really disappointing because in order to even get access into this community, um, we've had to wait weeks and talk to them and win them over and persuade them to let us film here and only then with the bribe of a television, which is why I bought the television. Except now that apparently they won't let me in uh, and they're not even sure they want a television. Can I go in here with the... That was a yes, but no. As in, wait. People just ignore you or, or look at you blankly, which of itself is very threatening. And I'd assumed that it was being Western and pale skin that produced that result, but I suspect it's to any outsider from, from anywhere, including the rest of Mumbai. So apparently we can go in now. The discussions go straight over my head. But two hours later, negotiations are over and they finally let me in. I'm excited to be here. And what a different, fascinating place it is. The small group of potters from Gujarat who came here over 70 years ago has now grown to 10,000 people. Square this. If you go to Gujarat, apparently the villages look just like this, with the exception perhaps of a little less tin, a little less metal. <laughs> Despite being so densely packed, this place feels like an open village, and the arrangement of tiny, narrow homes around dozens of small squares results in a surprising sense of communal space.
Yeah. Kim Shaw? Yes, Maja. <laughs> Maja, uh, how are you? How are you? I'm Kevin. Hitesha. Ah, Hitesha, how are you? Kevin. Good, 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 good. Good to meet you. And uh, how many people live in your house? Uh, around 21. 21 people? <laughs> Including and my... she's your mother? Yeah, she's my mother. Would you thank her for, for putting me up and for having me to stay? <laughs> it's very generous of you. I've been told that Monica, one of the daughters, is the best English speaker in the family, but she isn't home from school yet. There's a lot of noise coming from next door. They're sorting out a length of fabric. So in the meantime, I just stick my nose into the family's business. Who's this for? Is it for you? Who's it for? It's for her. Is it the first time? First time. First time, first time she was a sari. She has no idea how to wear it. I keep thinking who are all these people, then I remember there are 21 people who live in this house, so that's a, this is, you know, so a small portion of the family. They're all wandering off now. Upstairs, yeah. I have no idea. My Gujarat. She's a nurse, very small, zero. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes. Are you Monica? Yes. Hi. Hello, Kevin. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. With all these people living in this narrow house, each room has oh, to serve as sleeping wow. quarters for at least five people. This yeah. one, his house. That's your house. Come yeah. on. Yeah. This is their kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very nice. Uh, yeah, With a wooden kitchen. board behind yes. the gas fire, yeah. ready to catch fire at any moment. Yeah. Um, but no windows here. No window. No window. No. Only one small window. Okay. What? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's more than small, it's yeah. minute. <laughs> Can you imagine if this place went up in flames? Oh. Well, you never would get out. Can you, imagine, can you imagine if this caught fire, this place? I mean, this is an entirely wooden structure set within these brick walls. Woof. You know? There's another floor. Yeah, Hello, that's the electric light gone. Uh, this is. Um, it's asbestos. You know? Asbestos, asbestos roof. Yeah. and you know how dangerous that yeah. is, isn't it? If you break yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. This is my house. Okay. Please come. Oh, ow. Oh, oh so, no, so I just stopped my toe. Oh, my Sorry. God. Don't worry, on the step. Bye. Move. Please move. be careful. Preparing food on the floor mm. in my country is considered very unsanitary. It's not what we do. No, no. But then I suppose you're on your bare feet and, and socks. There's no shoes in, in, no, in here. No, no, no. Shoes are not allowed over here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, our floor is fully clean. Yeah, other than my director's shoes, which she seems to be wearing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the <Huh>? cameraman. <laughs> your feet, my, my supper. Your feet, my supper. Stay there. Uh, how many people sleep in here? Five members. Five. My father sleeps in this place, yeah. Here. And my uh, brother sleeps here, neighboring to my father. Yes. Nearby, yes. And here my mother. Yes, she has the bed. And I. Yes. And my sister. Wow. And the budgie mm. has more room than anybody. <laughs> Where am I sleeping? Uh, it's your. It's. It's depend on you. No, when... it doesn't depend on me. Ah. <laughs> There's no space left. Um, I, Mama, sleep the, I sleep with the budgie. Again, we have pictures. On downstairs on the floor. I have floor ma huye ke aya. Ha to hui jay to hale. My mother is telling you can sleep in this bed. No, I would not ever dream of sleeping in your mother's no bed. No problem, bhai. No, and I thought, no, no, no. <laughs> Tell me, Monica, how am I supposed to sit? Uh, uh, you have to bend your two uh, this knees, and you have to sit uh, in this position. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. Oh my goodness. Push your pant a little up, so okay. it will be comfortable. That, it won't make any difference, my pants. It's got nothing to do with my trousers. Uh, it's, got, it's got everything to do with my hips. Oh. And the thing is, I'm trying really hard, yeah. but it hurts. I can see that. Yeah. It's not comfortable. Yeah. It seems that the key to making a space for yourself here is flexibility. Every room here is a workroom, a living room, dining room, and a bedroom. Who should I ask about sex? I mean, you know, how do, how do people reproduce in these conditions? Well, maybe there are agreed moments, you know, when the house is sort of evacuated. I could ask the mama. I think she... <laughs> no, I can't, because that involves using her daughter to translate. No, that won't work. Jitesh, tell me something. Um, it's a sort of delicate subject, really. But if you meet a girl and you marry her, yeah? yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah? And you want to make babies. 
<laughs> when and where do you do this? Because there is no privacy, there's no room, there's no, there's nowhere to go. What do you do if you want to get together with uh, a girl? Like, uh, right now what we are doing is like, uh, we are just dividing these rooms in a compartment, like for the privacy. Yeah, yeah, but you still hear everything. Yeah? What happens when you meet a girl uh -huh. and you want some privacy with her? <laughs> Where do you go? I can go in a lodge or in a hotel. A hotel? Yeah. So is that what you do? You book a hotel for an afternoon or an evening yeah. and... Okay. <laughs> I feel a little bit guilty that I'm not doing anything. <laughs> because, because all around me people are involved. There's a boy over there flying a kite, people working. And I, I feel as a guest here, I ought to sort of be offering to help. I don't know, that lady looks as like she could do with a hand, doesn't, doesn't she? But... Can you ask this lady if she needs any help? No, she doesn't want any help. She's laughing. Both of them are laughing. Because I'm useless. I'm a useless piece of Western telefluff. Up to a million people live in just one square mile in Darrowvi. At its heart, the most densely populated slum on earth. And I'm beginning to think it's one of the most inspiring places I've ever seen. It's all down to sharing space. Here, people play, work, and even wash their clothes and dishes outside their front doors so that much of the daily drudgery is a social affair, done with neighbours. It's what we call community. It's what people have been doing for tens of thousands of years. And that's why it works. And it's only in the last 50 years in Britain that we managed to screw that up completely and move people out and put them in little boxes and destroy communities. And I mean, look, there are, I'm, not, I'm not bigging it up because there are negative points about it as well, obviously. But it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's got some really good things going for this place. There's women vomiting out of the window. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that's our house. She's vomiting out of our window, yeah, of, of, our, of the window above us, yeah. <laughs> My stomach's holding itself together all right after that lunch, but I'm not sure how long for. I didn't drink the water, though. You're the man that likes everything to have been designed by architects. Here, you've got no, I, architecture without yeah, architecture. No, I'm, see, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not into everything being designed by architects at all. I'm into a kind of quality, and <laughs> this, is, this isn't the best kind of environmental <laughs> air quality here. <laughs> but I'm, what I'm into is the fact that human beings love complexity. We love stuff to be interesting and varied and textured and delightful. And that's what we respond to. We do not respond to everything being in straight lines and painted white. That's dull because we get bored, we get bored of it very quickly. We get bored of housing estates, we get bored of industrial estates, we get bored of shopping centers because they just don't offer that depth and that layering. And it's all here, my God, is it all here. You can see that as, a, as a, an international aid organization coming here, you just look at the squalor and the piles of rubbish and the broken paving and you think, no, no, this is all gonna change, you know, this is awful and, and these houses are black with soot and, and it's unhygienic and there is cholera and there is of course these things are all true the health here is bad and the, and the air is bad but at the same time there is also this beauty and I, that is the really hard thing to get your head around is that we measure beauty in our environment we look at our environment and say you know have i got the latest range of furniture do i have, have I got posh lighting in my house does my garden look pretty have i got a nice looking you know contemporary car here it's all about a human being. Look at these individuals, they look, they are the best dressed people on the planet. They all look beautiful, every one of them. And that's how they measure, that's how they measure beauty. They don't, they don't look at the heap of shit down the alley. Back at the homestead, it's seven o'clock, and life seems remarkably familiar as I settle down to an evening with the family in front of the TV. Hello. 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 Of course, here there are three generations right, watching. You? Apparently, Mr. Bean is completely huge in India, isn't he? Everybody watches. Everybody knows Mr. Bean. Yeah. Even Grandma knows Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. 
There's only one word to describe this place, and that is intense, isn't it? You know, this is the very idea of sleeping in this tinderbox of a building with 21 people. It's, it's, it's intense. Everything's so communal. We're just not used to that. Everything, no privacy. At all. When are you going to bed? Are you going to bed soon? Because obviously I'm not going to bed until you do. 12 o'clock, I think so. No, 12. 12, 12. 12. In which case I will just go to bed here now. <laughs> right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So good night. It is a quarter past midnight before the family finally disappear off to bed. And all falls quiet until Oh, bloody hell. I just saw him disappear up. How a rat gets into a bag suspended off a hook on a wall, I don't know. I haven't slept very much tonight. And there's one just here, just investigating my trousers. And look, it's now quarter past five, right? I thought, I thought this lot all got up at five o'clock. They were all talking as well. They were talking till about one. Having gone to bed at gone twelve, quarter past twelve. Chit chat, chit chat. They're silent now, aren't they? They sleep through the rats. There's five of them next door. Not a dicky. But I just kept waking up thinking about rat urine and vials disease and plague. <laughs> I just don't fancy catching bubonic plague. I really don't. Oh. God, I can't, no, I, I've, I can't do this anymore. <sighs> oh, look, they just put the parrot out. Good morning. How are you? Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Wish I could say the same. Do you have the same positive feelings about this place this morning as you did yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just missing a bit of civilization, that's so. all. Flushing toilets, hot water, uh, sanitary conditions, rooms that don't have rats in them, on the whole, are things to be desired, aren't they? I mean, I, it's sort of beyond my comfort threshold. By day, it's lovely. By night, it, it gets a bit more it's, it, intense. I can't believe how smartly dressed you are. It's wonderful. Thank you. Lovely, isn't she? You just wouldn't know, would you, that any of these people kind of on the street, they look so immaculate. And they will have slept the night in a room with probably three or four other people with an outside toilet, which is just a hole in the ground, you know. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Just as the daily routine of the potteries begins, so the rest of Darabi wakes up and goes to school or work. A staggering 85% of people here have a job in the slum, a figure that puts us to shame. And astonishing as it sounds, some people here are actually very wealthy. Lamppost. I've been given the dubious address of Lamppost 69, the Darabi-born entrepreneur, Mr. Mabin Sheikh. Lamppost 69. A self-made millionaire who still chooses to live and work in the slum. It's a staircase with no stairs on it. It's rotted through. Hello, excuse me, I'm looking for Mr. Mabin. No. You can't imagine that a millionaire businessman is, is based here, can you? Mabin. Mr. Mabin. Because businesses here are outside the law, 
unregistered and therefore unregulated. It's a world that foreign eyes don't normally get to see. Do you know Mr. Mabeen's factory? I get these completely blank um, expressions, which almost look pass passive aggressive, you know? Like they're sort of looking at me thinking, take one step nearer, we'll shoot you. Mr. Mabeen is going to show me how industry here works. But trying to find a secret millionaire isn't straightforward. Excuse me, I'm looking for Mr. Mobin. Mobin? Mr. Mobin? No, okay, thank you. I just think that if you're white, stood here, that there's a tremendous reluctance to um, help because they suspect that I'm from some organization or the police or some government agency or something. Does anybody know Mr. Mobin? Mobin? Yeah. That way. Okay, th thank you. Mind the big hole in the ground full of crap. I mean, when I say crap, I mean human excrement. In here. Do you know Mr. Mobin? Uh, yeah. Up, upstairs, here. It's here. His, his office, the office of the multimillionaire, is accessed by a, a shower. I can't, I can't believe this. Hello. Hello, pleased to meet you. You have to believe in Dharavi. I, yeah, but yes. this, to find your office via a shower is almost perverse. It's like being in a James Bond movie. It's a kind of space management in Dharavi. But everybody I've spoken to, and it must be, what, 150 yeah. people, they say the same thing, that, that I, I, yeah, nobody knows you, nobody's heard of you. I just get this blank expression. It's a fantastic defense system. Yeah. <laughs> nobody can find you. Yes, they don't find with the real name. They'll find with the other name, pet name, or maybe through friends. So what's your pet name? My pet name is Mr. Matwale. What's it mean? My name means a jolly kind of person. Oh, that's good. That's, <laughs> no, that's, that's a good nickname to have. So this is what you make here? This is, this is the trolley. This is a... Assembled over here. Oh, this is a thing that goes inside a suitcase. So you, you wheel it along? Yeah, yeah. So how, how many do you make a year? Or a day or a week? Seven to eight hundred pieces per day. That's a huge number. Yeah. How much money do you make on a suitcase? Four to five rupees per pieces. Four that's, to five rupees. That's about three pence. Yeah. It's not but very it, much money, but, but then it, But you with the volume, it. with the volume and with the standard Indian rupees, it is enough for us. Thanks to Mr. Mabeen, or whatever his business name is, I'm gonna get access to an astonishing world of fifteen thousand one room factories a thriving hub of industry with a turnover of one billion dollars a year. But it's a hidden world with a darker side. Wow. Oh, lots, what, where are we now? Lots of flies here. Raw skin, buffalo skin. There is blood down there. Yeah, mind just... Just mind with your camera. I'm being shown around the hidden industrial heart of Daravi by the self-made slum millionaire Mobin Sheikh. Shall we move to the bakery? That's not a bakery. That looks like a... That looks like a... a like, looks like a junkyard, junkyard. Yeah, well, it looks like people... Yeah, it does look like a come, squatter's come, come, yard. Come, 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 come this side. This is not a bakery. Oh, God, look. Industry here is largely illegal, untaxed and thriving. Daravi is a city being formed before your eyes, and capitalism here is in rude, primitive health. If you put on the packets, made yes, in Daravi... Yes, the made in Daravi... Would the they people, sell? <laughs> maybe some people will be cautious about the hell. They will be nervous by the label. So they put the label with some other address. Oh, right, so other companies that will yes. rebrand the, the blank packaging that leaves here. Yeah. How many bakeries in Daravi altogether? I think around 300 bakeries That's are there. That's ridiculous. That yeah, must be feeding the whole of Mumbai. And the oh. confection is of coconut. Oh my goodness. Very delicious. Oh. It makes me begin to question why we have all this health and safety in my country and white working environments and people with white gowns and you know, looking like surgeons and actually what they produce is <laughs> rubbish, plastic bread that tastes foul. And this is utterly delicious. There are over 15,000 factories here, churning out products that get shipped around the globe. No regulations or taxes, maximum use of space and cheap labor keep the production costs very low. So this is the cafeteria, self-service. Between the workshops and canteens, washrooms and barber shops, 
you never need leave this place, which by the looks of things, people don't. So what is this obsession about dental health? Because everyone I see is cleaning their teeth all the time. There's three toothbrushes up there. No, no, some of the workers who don't have home in this city, a few of them, maybe 25% of them, they sleep in the factory only. Oh, I see. So, so when they get oh, up, oh. they brush their teeth. We think, no way, that you've got to work in an area and live in another. And the idea of living and working in the same place is anathema to many people, and particularly if it involves heavy industry or, or actually chopping up bits of animal to make skins, you know. The idea of living above that, and look, you see, look, she's living there, and they're doing that just there. And no doubt there's somebody living up top as well. It's this extraordinary way in which everything here is compressed and condensed. And as a result, this area produces $1 billion worth of stuff a year. It would cost billions of billions of pounds to set that kind of economy up. And yet it's all happening here in this tiny area. And people are living here at the same time. But despite the energy of this place, I'm appalled at the working conditions. These sweatshops are like the 19th century dark satanic mills of Britain. It's hard to believe that people here do not feel exploited. What's happening here? Yeah, they are making shoes. Around 13 people working in this small area. 13? Making They're the wooden heels for shoes. And what, do, do they... You, you call it amazing. I'm yeah. quite shocked by it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a shit heap, isn't it, really? People are working in really horrible conditions, producing amazing things, and at the same time, they seem to be happy. <laughs> I mean, try and tie all that together, you know? When you weren't filming, I asked Nabeen, what's the youngest age that you can employ children? He said, there isn't one. He says, if somebody comes here and if they can offer a skill and we can offer them a job, then they'll work for us. So some of the kids working there seem to me to be, what, 12, 14, perhaps? I've got a 12-year-old son. I mean, I don't think I'd, en I'd enjoy finding him working in that place. Making trolleys so that we can travel the world, go on holiday. The thing I'm coming to realize is that Darrowvi, without planning or design, is doing in 20 years what our society did in 200. Most people here work. And while some children also work, the vast majority also get the chance to go to school. Hey, how are you? How are you? I'm fine, yes. Good. How many years have you got more now in school? Uh, one year, I think. One year? Yes. And then what? Then uh, college, yeah. And then? And then. <laughs> And then, job, job. What job? I told you, you know, that about air hostess. Yeah. Air hostess. Yes, yes, yes. Travel the world. What about your friend? I want to be a lawyer. Wow. That's a lot of years in college. So this is your way home every day? Yes, yes. It amuses me, you know, in, in England, um, girls particularly, you know, in some places, they're not allowed to walk home by themselves. Their mothers go and pick them up in the car. Here, you can walk safely. Yes, yeah. What about one o'clock in the morning or middle of the night? Is it still safe? Yes, yes, yeah, it's safe. It's amazing. So you're embarrassed I picked you up at school? No, no, no. No? No. <laughs> and that's yet another surprising thing about this slum. It has virtually no crime. Wow, 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 look at this. Like a village fate. Monica's neighborhood is getting together for a religious festival, and of course, it's held communally. Amazing outfits. Saris with glittery gold bits. What is this? Dogla. My food's been manhandled by eight people now. Thank you. Okay, Thank you very much. You know these people, they live hand to mouth and a gift of food is a really big thing. But it presents me with a really big quandary because I mean, obviously a glass of water you can just quietly tip into a plant pot as it were. You know, uh, but food, it's really hard to make it disappear. I mean, that, there was, honestly, there were five or six blokes up there, each of them kind of just shifting my food around on my plate with their fingers. I'm sure it's fine. Pray God, you know, Jeshni Krishna, huh? <laughs> I hope. People are prepared to share everything here. They also share a sense of belonging to this place. And they do genuinely seem very happy. 
These are the sort of community values that planners in Britain would love to see. Down there, there are three generations of women sitting, talking, and three generations of men sitting over there. And we've lost that. I mean, we don't. We 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 we, we can hardly find that in Britain now. Neighbourhoods where you find all the generations together, where old people are respected and incorporated into street life and have a healthy relationship with the kids and vice versa. And. and the buildings may not be great, and the wiring is absolutely atrocious, and the drainage isn't brilliant either. But but these people are so happy, and they produce students like Monica, who is brilliant and sparky. This place has got a sense of community, and, and you, know, you will not find, I suspect, anybody here who is lonely. You will not find a story in the paper, I'm sure, here, of a body being found in a flat decomposing three months after somebody's died. But that happens in England and in, in Britain. That happens in our country. It happens all the time. You have to ask which is the more civilised place, don't you? Ah, oh, bloody rat, go on. He's chanting his luck, wasn't he? He's coming straight towards me. He knows how, how, how I hate them now. I'm going to go to a hotel tonight. Rats and bubonic plague apart, I've begun to see what works here and why this slum is being celebrated. Lovely, food everywhere. Next, I'm going to go to work. Childhood dream to ride up front, you know, in a dump truck with the dustbin men. Darabi was the rubbish heap of Mumbai. They're queuing up like hungry beggars. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Now I reckon it's the recycling capital of the world. I don't want it. I, I bloody well don't want it. But with property prices in the city rising, illegal houses here are up for sale. This is worth 40, 50,000 pounds. Yeah. It's like money for all rope, isn't it? And now Mumbai is one of the most expensive places to live in the world. It wants to raise Darabi to the ground. So are you telling me literally that one day a digger will appear at the end of this road yeah. and it will start demolishing the buildings? Yes. Threatening to destroy everything we could learn from this place, the good things this slum has, and the lives of those who live here. Thousands of people yeah. relying on an industry which they've done here for decades is going to just be... I want to see for myself if Darabi can in any way be the answer to anyone's problems. I've been living in the slum for a week. Where am I sleeping? It's depend on you. No, it doesn't depend on me. Uh, no, there's no space left. And so far, I found a place where people live in unacceptable conditions. Can you imagine if this caught fire, this place? This is an entirely wooden structure set within these brick walls. And with plenty of rats. Oh, bloody hell. I can't. No, I, I, I can't do this anymore. But I've begun to see it also has things we lack in our cities. A strong sense of community, safe neighbourhoods, and an 85% employment rate that puts us in the UK to shame. Now, I'm going to work. Right, we get back on? Yeah, it's a childhood dream to ride up front, you know? In the jewel of Darabi's crown. Everything here is recycled. One of the world's biggest and most jaw-dropping recycling schemes. It's, it's, it's as though the place is deliberately trying to screw your mind, you know? Mumbai is one of the world's mega-cities. A population of 16 million people, but where more than half live in slums. The most talked about is Darabi where, surrounded by the city's skyscrapers and wealth, a million people are crammed into one square mile, recycling Mumbai's rubbish. Today, I want to see Darabi's recycling zone in action. It's a world that practically no one outside the slum sees. Not many people have the stomach to get past where I am now, its front door. These here, they're these here, these are the... Um... These are the toilets for the... Well, it's obvious, isn't it, what they are, really? Because as yesterday's shit passes floating by, so today's shit gets deposited just here. You can tell by the yellow streaks down the wall. 
But you know there's not even a toilet in these, there's not even a hole in the bottom of them, there's just a missing floorboard, that's all there is. This tiny little corridor along the back here is just full of flies, and these people are just queuing up to use these. This is about as basic as you can get, isn't it? Uh, where, uh, uh, where's the recycling area? Is it just past here? Here. It's here. Where, where, in other words, where I've just walked along by the river. Yeah. What? I, I can't concentrate, actually. I've got this smell of human excrement in my nostrils. That was one of the most unpleasant experiences, not because of uh, what I was seeing, but just the smell of the flies. It's still there. What's in that? There's no fish in there, that's for sure. There's a lot of dengue fever, cholera, hepatitis. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so you fall in that, you die, don't you? It's, uh, that's just not right, that human beings have to live next to that. This poisoned river reflects one of the main paradoxes of Darabi. It can barely sustain life itself, but just yards away is the recycling area that could show us the way, so I'm told, to a sustainable future. Yogurt pots, packaging, but they're sorting it all into different types of plastic. Manually, sitting on the floor, in a shed. Amazing. Like a little workshop for every tiny little subdivision of recycling that exists. This place is extraordinarily imaginative. Everything's recycled, from containers and cosmetics to computer keyboards. They are stripping out copper cable, worth fortune, obviously. That can be sent off a scrap and melted down. This is incredible. Look, this is um, electrical cabling cover, which has been stripped off. And this is water pipe. I didn't think you could recycle half this stuff. And that is the amazing thing about this place. They seem to be able to recycle everything. You know, in the UK, we get told, oh, no, you can't recycle this plastic. We can't recycle. No, no, can't do this. Everything here is recycled. In the UK, 23% of our plastic waste gets recycled. Here in Mumbai, it's an incredible 80%. And it happens in Darabi. So I've decided to follow the recycling trail. I've come into the city. I want to find out how such a vast quantity of Mumbai's rubbish finds its way to the slum. Hello. Hi. The city's dustbin men have let me join their morning shift. Stay for me. Thank you. Good colour. It's a childhood dream to ride up front, you know, in a dump truck with the dustbin men. But now you can take it off. You just keep it on all the time, your mask, yeah? No, no, only when we work. See, I don't know what you look like. Ah, now I know what you look like. <laughs> Great way of seeing Mumbai. This is like seeing it from the top of the double-decker bus. Over a million rubbish bags are collected across Mumbai every day. Can't stop myself. Right, we get back on. So the great warrior of the road, isn't it? This machine. Nothing, nothing will get in the way of this. Gargantuan beast. So we're stopping at the Mayfair Hotel, so we can see what they chuck out. Oh, that's kitchen waste. That's lovely. That's spilled everywhere. Yeah. In the UK, bin men, if they turned up and found that, they'd just walk away, wouldn't they? They'd say, I'm sorry, mate. And, and rightly so. OK, we get another one. Lovely, food everywhere. What's interesting is that there are, I've seen no plastic bottles, nothing of any real kind of value, because um, the staff already probably have gone through and separated out and bagged up and sold on for money. The, uh, the really high-value recycling stuff, like, like the plastic bottles. Along Mumbai's streets, people wait to rifle through the bins for what's left. An army of 35,000 rag pickers feeding Darabi's insatiable appetite for plastic. Is this your bag, yeah? Let me see. 
No, 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 it's all paper and card and some plastic. She's got plastic as well. She's also sorted a great pile of rags as well here. Do you know, the thing is, I've... I've seen these people at work, and you see people going through rubbish, you think, oh, poor sod, you know, desperate for something to eat. They're not doing that, they're sorting the rubbish to earn money to get the recycled material out of it. And, uh, it's only sitting on the, on the truck today that my eyes were open. Suddenly I looked around and saw the city in a different kind of way, with these levels of people, all part of this great big recycling machine, you know, thousands of them. The plastic that's made it into the back of the truck the stuff that's evaded the hotel staff, servants and rag pickers, has by no means escaped. There's another army in wait on the city's dumps. Anywhere else in the world, this rubbish might be worthless. Here, recycling it is people's livelihoods. <laughs> This is one of Mumbai's vast dumps. Rubbish is destined to be moved from here to Daravi, where thousands of people are employed in an industry that recycled an incredible 80% of Mumbai's plastic waste, a figure that puts the UK to shame. But having spent the morning doing the city's rubbish round, I find it hard to believe there's anything of any value left. Wow. Oh, this is... These people are... They are rag pickers. Come. Yeah, I will in a minute. Chaleka. Huh? Nothing has prepared me for this. It's the side of Mumbai few people get to see, and that the authorities don't want me to see. It took weeks of negotiating to get access, and now I can see why. Uh, don't worry. I think you are I am a bit. Okay. I am a lot, actually. Okay. But they're sifting through everything. Yes. That girl, that little girl is opening bags of yes. waste food and rubbish that yes. people have thrown yes. away. Yes, and... yes. Just collecting the bags. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. That's animals' intestines down there. The stench here is just. They've got these weird hooks to fish everything out with, but they're not wearing gloves. Each rag picker is searching for their specific plastic polystyrene packaging, drinking straws even something which we in the West think is beyond recycling, used plastic bags. Everything has a value. These kids are how old? 12, 14? These kids here are bare feet. This boy in front of me here is, is barefoot. He's barefoot in, the, in all this shit. Mud and all the liquid waste from these piles, you know? Oh, bless her, this girl's trying not to get her feet dirty, look. Oh, yeah, this guy, he's spraying. What's he spraying? It's, it's completely token. He's just wandering around, spraying a jet. Oh, he's spraying disinfectant. <laughs> Pointless. Pointless. Oh, Christ. I can't cope with these people doing this job. Poor souls. Look, they're, they're queuing up like hungry beggars waiting for this thing to uh, disgorge, look. Oh God, that's gonna fall on that woman's head. You want to know what recycling is? That's recycling. There's 20 people around a heap of shit working under the hot sun in appalling conditions. Uh, how, 
much do they earn these people? Uh, they must be earning around 100 to 150 every day. A pound? Rupees, yes. A pound a day. Yes. Their livelihood depends on old, broken, filthy yes. plastic bags. I don't care how necessary the living is to these people. I just... Uh, makes me want to stop using plastic bags for a start. And, and much as they perform a very useful job, I'm sorry, I can't think straight. I'm so confused by this place. I'm so upset by this place. You know, it's sort of, it's, um, it's degrading. There aren't many things in, in life that are, but sorting other people's shit is. At the edge of the dump, the rag pickers sort their haul before selling it on to Daravi's dealers. You see that? She's doing it barefoot. She sells these bags to this man, right. to Abu, yeah? Right. And he buys them. How much yes. for? How much is a bag of that? He buys for three rupees. Three, three rupees, that's tuppence, 2p. And then this, that is for five rupees. Five rupees for the bag of plastic, so you get a premium for that. <laughs> this woman works on this dump every day of the year to scrape enough money together to put her two children through school. She's saying that she's ashamed to be filmed doing a dirty job. I've spent the best part of a day on these dumps, and I'm completely torn by what happens here. Without it, what happens? Without it, these people have no jobs. Without it, actually, that mountain of rubbish over there is four times as high, you know. And without it, we run out of resources. Back in Darrowby, a lot of the stuff that we would bury in landfill in the UK arrives around the clock at an area called Compound 13, Darrowby's recycling zone. My key to getting into this largely illegal and unregulated place is my slum millionaire friend, Mobin Sheikh, who it turns out is something of a plastics guru. What plastic is that? It is HIPS, high impact polystyrene. But how do you know what everything is? I have been working since childhood in this. So you know so all these different I plastics? Know all. I can but how many, how, many different, how many different plastics are there? Two or three hundred now? There are around 100 to 200 different kinds okay, of plastic. Okay, yeah. Uh, and I can tell them by just looking at them. So what's this plastic here? That here looks very it's white. It's a food container, PPE. PPE. Yeah, what's polypropylene. This? Polypropylene. Polypropylene. Okay. Oh my plastic. good lord, this is yeah. everything. This it's is everything. This is uh, CDs, bits of wire and radio. And these are from electronic waste. So what will this stuff become? That CD will be recycled again into made into electrical switches. Right. So what this, about this clear stuff? This clear what stuff does that become? Polystyrene it is. Yeah. It will be reconverted into plastic bangles which ladies wear. Bangles. There is a lot of demand for bangles in India. Right. Does it mean eventually the plastic eventually yes. has to stop being something? Does it... No, plastic cannot be stopped. It will be continuously get recycled and really? recycled and recycled. What about, oh look, what's this? These are, looks like, this these are, are paint these cans. Are paint drums, yes. They are heated and reconditioned. What will about be all the paint residue inside? Is that is burnt off? That is burnt off. That is burnt off. That's quite that's toxic, isn't it, often? It's, you're talking about volatile compounds, dried paint. It's very dangerous work, this. Very dangerous. Oh my God, Father! What's the life expectancy of this man? He's not going to live very long doing this. He will live as long as you live. You really? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, really. I, hope so. But I don't know what that means because it's it's highly toxic and there's no extraction here. The harder no the work, the more the immune system gets stronger. Oh my goodness <laughs> me! Look, 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 look! It's going out as a newly primed, See, all the step red oxide painted drum. This isn't recycling as much as it's, it's not. Uh, reconditioning down. of Re drum. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mabin. It's reconditioning. Reconditioning of drum. 
They come in like this. Yes. They go out. See the Persian paints, Asian paints, and all. This is one of the godowns for recycling of this waste generated from the hotel industry. Right. If you wish to join them in and with sorting work, doing the sorting work, you'll yeah. we'll be able to understand better. So you're suggesting I get down there and <laughs> yeah, got to get it. down along with them, and I shall meet you later. Uh, right. Have a good time over here. <clears throat> Thank okay, you. Kevin. I might. I could squat just. Just here. Ah, uh, thank you. She's slitting them for me. Right, the process here is to take the clear ones, clear ones go in there, and take the labels off. The labels are PVC, so they go in that one. Only white can go in here. I mean, you know, this stuff has been sitting on rubbish tips all over Mumbai. Oh, this one's been nibbled at by rats. Look, 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 there are the teeth marks. Quite dispiriting. I've only been doing it for 10 minutes. Surrounded by kids working with next to no protective gear, this is another downside of Darabi's recycling miracle. The worst of it is, um, I didn't realize, look, 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 underneath here, at the bottom of the pile, syringe, 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 syringe. It's hospital waste. And there may be in amongst there some needles as well. I mean, they're more minus needles, but you don't really want to know, do you? And you certainly don't want to be handling it. Yeah. Which, where does it go, though? Which one? I don't want it. I, I bloody well don't want it. Just when you think you might be approaching an end to something, more shit appears. Hello, Mr. Kevin. Hello, Mr. Mabee. I've been all day long in the recycling area. I well, think. yeah, well, enough uh, to, yes, disenchant me. I tell you, in my country, recycling is almost fashionable. It's become a sort of middle-class fashion to recycle. There's nothing glamorous about this. No. I can tell you, nobody in my country would be interested in doing this job, sorting through parts of plastic to discover syringes on the floor underneath. I mean, nobody would do it. Nobody would do it. So where's the next load then? Now the, it is uh, closing time. <laughs> now it is closing time. Oh. It's almost seven oh, o'clock. Joy. <laughs> now they clean up the area, and this area will be made into a makeshift sleeping area. Oh my goodness! Really? If you wish, you can join them. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't. I, I, that's, I'll, leave, I'll leave them to their re relaxing time. I get exhausted by this place, and the reason I get exhausted is because absolute delight is alternated with utter horror. It's that kind of boom, 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 boom. Yeah, you know, it's it's picture after picture after picture. It's 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 as though the place is deliberately trying to screw your mind, you know. And it's exhausting when you come up here. What you see is this great sea of plastic, and this place recycles 80 percent of Mumbai's plastic, 80%. Look, it's all here, look. That's an epic statistic. But despite its success stories, Darabi's recycling days look numbered. A $2 billion redevelopment plan is set to raise all of recycling and most of the slum to the ground. The trouble is with human beings is that it's always easier to knock things down. And when you let a developer in anywhere, or a corporation in anywhere, the first inevitable instinct is to destroy everything to remake it. This should be remodeled in a major way that this should become a healthier place to live and work. Simple as that, yeah? Daravi, India's biggest slum, is located only minutes away from the Bollywood mansions and skyscrapers of Mumbai's financial district. And that has made it a valuable target for redevelopment. You can't argue with demolishing the bad, but I've discovered that there are many inspiring elements here, and they too will be raised to the ground. Kumbawada is the pottery area where last week I stayed with Monica and 20 other members of her family. It's a place where 10,000 people live and work in one of the oldest and most well-established slum neighborhoods. Hi. 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 Hi.
At the end of a long day recycling rubbish, it was a pleasure to be back again. Hello. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Grandma. How are you? Yeah. How are you, Monica? Yes, yes. Good. Bye. I think you're tired. Good. I am tired. I want to know what happens to Monica and her family when the bulldozers arrive. There are developers talking about redeveloping Dharavi. Yeah. And, I mean, does, does that happen everywhere? I am developing Dharavi, isn't it? Dharavi. Yes, yes, yes. When is this going to happen? Is it soon? Yeah, soon it will happen. It will be. I cannot believe thousands of people relying on an industry which they've done here for decades is going to just be. She is saying that our house is big, but they are giving but us small. But we want yeah. like this house, big one. But they are giving us small one. But they want to destroy everything yeah, here yeah, yes. and give you a new house. Yeah, so new what's, house, what's yeah. wrong? What's wrong with that? But, but they, they are giving small, 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 space. Space. small area. Yes. And we are not comfortable <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine it being much more. There are 21 people living here. They are doing pottery work, so it's not uh, 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 possible for them to live in a small compartment, yeah? No, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Exactly. There's no, there's no, I mean, the developer isn't going to give you a kill on the roof of your building, is he? Yes. If, uh, if they destroy this, then where we will go? Monica and the potters are not alone in worrying about what's going to happen to them. A ten-minute walk away from the pottery area is an ancient fishing village. It's been described as Daravi's hidden gem. It's an ancient old building here with wooden shutters and here, stone, not brick. Namaste. It no longer looks over the water because the mangrove swamps have been filled with rubbish, but it still retains a lot of charm. Look at this. This is an entire fishing market down here. I'm thinking that this is, in my, in my imaginings of what India is like, this is it. it people, colour, noise, laughter, energy. This is not a shanty. It feels more like a bustling Mediterranean village, one that would also have evolved organically. Amazing colours. With no grand plan, no developers, no architects. Oh my goodness, this is uh, Darabee meets Art Deco down here. These people have created, over time, a place of real quality. Somewhere with strong, safe neighbourhoods and squares where people of all ages meet. It's all the things we used to have. And these are built-in uh, built flower baskets. Sorry? On each column. Concrete basket for the yeah, flowers. Concrete basket, come. This is great, isn't it? Terrazzo marble. It's really kind of high grade, all this. But here, marble slab, storage underneath, seats and benches everywhere. It's, um, it's uh, chaotic as you would expect it to be, but it's also magical, this place. The residents, though, are fearful all this could disappear with the redevelopment plan. If you could dream up an ideal place for a community to live in, then pretty well most of what you would hope for, being able to walk everywhere, minimal car use, you know, wonderful old buildings here and there, great sense of community, public space, market that you could walk to. <laughs> these things, these things most people dream of, you know? Look, and, and an open-air restaurant. Shops on every corner, being able to find everything you want within five minutes of leaving your home. And living in a community of people who've lived there for, for 50 or 100 years, you know, generations have been here. That, th those things together have to constitute the components of a civilised life. Really? Do you know about the redevelopment plans for Daravi? Yeah, okay. What's your view about this area? What do you need here? What would you yeah, like here? Need is, uh, drainage. Drainage is just like, like this, which has to be put. Anytime it gets overflown. Then. So in the rainy season, it really does flood here? Anytime. Not only in rainy season, but anytime. Okay. Yeah. If 
The Corporation of Mumbai have their way and this area goes. Do you want to live in a seven or ten story building in a flat in 225 square feet? The majority of them don't want. Okay. Majority of them. Do some people want it? Some people want it. But majority of them, not exist. Why do you want to keep this place? This is our village ancestors place. Ancestors place. Forefathers. From what you're saying, you would like to see some improvements here for drainage and water. Yes, yes. But yes. actually, other than that. Other than that, we don't want skyscrapers and Shanghai's and anything over here. Can you imagine a developer coming here and saying that's all got to go? And this building should be listed. <laughs> What's driving the threat of redevelopment is the value of land. It's already become so high, the slum even has its own estate agents. I, don't, I just don't understand how they can sell property that people don't exactly own, do you know what I mean? That's <laughs> that. The property king with the top real estate on his books is a man called Shaquille, but he doesn't make it easy to window shop. Well, it ain't down there, is it? Look. Is it? Hello? Shaquille? There's somebody preparing potatoes there. It's like no estate agents I've been to. Hello, I'm Kevin. How are you? I have my, my head on the fans here. These fans are kind of like haircut level, you know? So this is where you do business? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? What's the blackboard for? Just for... Uh, Fighting some requirements and that. Okay, obviously business is booming at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and you take a commission. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's how you earn the money. One percent commission. One percent. Yeah. Do you know what? Total cost. We, I, I wouldn't mind the state agents uh, having facilities like this in the UK if they only charge one percent. In the UK, they charge two or three. No, no, no. In Arab, especially one percent. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I want to sell my flat and all. Despite the empty blackboard, Shaquille's keen to take me to his prime property. What a shit. Yeah, this is uh, a new building. Yeah. A new building? Yeah, yeah, new building. Two bedroom, yeah. It is an expensive flight in Dharam. Is it one of the most expensive? Yeah, yeah. It is one of the most expensive. Well, wow. and that's 50 lakh. Yeah. 80, 90,000 pounds. Fleet fortune in Dharabi. Yeah, in yeah. a slum. In, in Dharabi. At 90 grand, it's got to look better on the inside. So is there a problem going in or...? Oh, yeah, actually... You want to get permission? Yeah, right. Okay, they're going to have discussions, yeah? Yeah, yeah. We will get the permission tomorrow. You want to see inside? Yeah, if we, we can, can, get can we... Permission tomorrow. Tomorrow. We've got to come back tomorrow. There's no permission either. All right, we can go in now. Thank you very much. A few confused phone calls later, and we're in. On our way up to a very dark, very small apartment. So this is what? What do we get? This is a hall. This is a hall. Right. Two so, bathroom. Yeah. This WC, American style. American style WC. This bedroom. Right. So more or less three rooms this size and a toilet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And another toilet. Okay. So this room is eight foot wide. There we are. Look, it's one, oh, two paces wide. Uh, actually, that's probably, yeah, seven foot, and it's uh, two, uh, five, yeah, five, well, five, maybe 15 feet long, 15, yeah. Phew. You do get a cornice, though. Shock. I'm shocked that it costs so much money. Sitting in the middle of Mumbai, Darabi's square mile is worth billions to developers. Despite everything positive I've learned about the place, to them, it's an eyesore and a real estate gold mine. The man driving this redevelopment is architect and property tycoon Mukesh Mehta. This is a matter of shame, you know, right in the heart of the city, the financial capital of, of India. How are we going to accept this? The answer is no. Mukesh's grand vision is to rid India of the slums he thinks shame it. He wants to rebuild it with the help of world-class architects like Norman Foster with, yes, you've guessed it, 
a seductive landscape of glass and steel, walkways, green spaces and monorails. These are ground and 14 storey uh, structures. These are ground and As for the slum dwellers, they'll get rehoused in tower blocks. For the slum dwellers. The thing is, you know, we did all this in the 1960s. We took slums, we, we demolished them, we put up uh, next door to them, big, you know, 20, 20 storey buildings. And we are demolishing those buildings. I know, now. but because of the densities uh, that exist in Dharavi, we have no option but to go vertical. One thing I know from visiting places like the finish slides, you know, the future, the idea that you're proposing, is that we've done all this stuff so, so much in the West, and so often people are miserable as a result. What I'm asking is, how do they maintain that same I social will integrity? I absolutely show you the detailed plans on how we will go about with that. Mukesh's plans are ambitious and persuasive and will no doubt reveal a shiny new Daravi. But craftsmen like the potters will be forced to live and work in separate places, and industries like recycling will get shut down. Who is eligible for what here? As for the government rules, anyone who has been living in the apartment since 2000 is eligible uh, on the ground floor, not mm. on the upper floors. So you're only going to offer a certain proportion of the population? Uh, absolutely, home. absolutely. That, that's the part of the scheme that I'm not in agreement with. In Mumbai, the city of dreams, the government is desperate to rid itself of slums, but it appears it just hasn't thought about the thousands of people who'll be displaced. I have a theory that I'm about to test. I've got myself a posh suit and got on the guest list at one of Mumbai's hottest parties this week. Hi, Kevin. Kevin McLeod, hello. Nice From England, how are you? Pleasure, how are you? My guess is that the other half of the city, Mumbai's fashionable, moneyed classes, have little idea what will be lost if the slum goes. Well, they would be very interested in knowing what you're doing. Really? You because they so? never get there anyway. <laughs> Just, do people not go? Uh, no. I'm just two miles from Darabi, but it may as well be a million. And I have to tell you guys, I wore this beautiful pink dress. Uh, last week I was sleeping uh, in, in Darabi. I spent the week with the... Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we know? No. It was okay. It was it was fine actually for a few days. Yeah. Uh, have you been? You know, I've been in passing. I mean, what's the general feeling in this end of Bombay about Darabi? What do people say? What are they? What's the, what's the impression that Darabi gives? Honestly, from people like my age in the twenties and stuff, they because of slum dog millionaire. You know, it's so sad that we living in Bombay. We don't know the kind of things that go around in Darby. We just see it as a slum area and that's yeah. it. We always look down upon it. But I think through the movie again, we have learned to look up to those people. And with such little things, they're still so happy. And we, with all our materialistic and superficial things, we're still sulking. Like, we have a lot to learn from You're them. not still sulking, are you? <laughs> not me, but Hello? a lot of us, yeah. Really? Where are you oh, staying? Don't let me ask you what you're uh, Do you know what? I've been staying in Darby. Uh, I've been saying this in families the other day. All the virus is going around. It was very like courageous of you to stay there. It's really gutsy. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh... staying in Bombay, I can't still do that. It seems my theory might be right. Mumbai really is a tale of two cities. One man who's concerned about the future of the slum dwellers is Professor of Architecture Mustansia Dalvi. He's giving me a warning of what redevelopment could look like. Yeah. Oh my goodness. This is... This looks super dense. It is. What are we looking at? It also the, shows you the future of a place like Dharavi. It's very, very densely packed so that they take the least area possible. And at the same time house the same number of people who earlier were spread out into ground plus one uh, buildings over a large area. They are just a couple of meters away they from are, each other, these buildings. When you have flats like these, you would have these long corridors accessing your individual apartment, which once you're inside and you lock up, you're completely isolated from the rest of the world. Mm. And that is a situation which would never happen in a slum, where you are always part of the community at large. I hadn't appreciated just how close and how, how mean they are. I mean, in comparison, my experience of staying with people in Daravi seems positively generous. One thing other that 
it really hits me about these buildings is that they look dirty and degraded, and yet, uh, how old are they? I wouldn't say that they're more than five, six years old. You're joking. Probably. No, 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 they, they've got to be older than that. No, not necessarily. <laughs> Th that's appalling. The view from above may be frightening, but down on the ground in Deravi, experiencing the mess of previous botched development plans is deeply depressing. These are vertical slums. Nobody's interested in quality in the built environment. Nobody's interested in looking after what they've got. I mean, the people of this place, I don't know what this was like when they moved in, but I can't believe it was exactly like this. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, how human beings can just focus on the little patch in which they, you know, they just, they operate and can't organize themselves to look after a bit of public space and trash what they've got, trash it. This is the most depressing place I've seen here. I, I, really don't, I really don't buy the fact that when you put people in to places like this that you get just as strong a sense of community as you do in places like Kumbawada or the transit camp. It just doesn't happen. And this is what does happen, this, this kind of trash. You know, it's, 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 uh, I don't care what Mater says about, about culture differences between the West and here. I think the world over, when you put people into buildings like this, this is what happens. I'm convinced of that. I've been here in Mumbai for more than two weeks, mostly in the slum below. But from up here, I can view Deravi the way the rest of the city sees it. I think people look at this place and they think, this is a slum. It's dirty, it's wild, it's dangerous, it's full of crime, and the people here live by whatever means possible. It just looks like one giant sprawling place, but I know that each of these areas is a separate community of people doing different things, living life slightly differently. And you know that the whole idea of taking these big chunks and dividing them up and saying, okay, here's sector one, two, three, four, five, and <laughs> and you, developer one, take this area and do do that. Developer two, you take this. It seems slightly nonsensical. Because the grain of this place is much finer than that. Even though people have been praising this place, before I arrived, I was very skeptical about what it could teach us. You expect to see, don't you, above that bridge a sign that said, Abandon hope, all ye who enter. It is without doubt the noisiest, dirtiest, most foul-smelling place I've ever been. Mind the dead rats. Just there. Oh, bloody hell. I just saw him disappear up. I, I, I can't do this anymore. You can't ignore the poor sanitation the overcrowding, the unhealthy working conditions. There is blood down there. Yeah, mind your step. Just mind with your camera. Oh my God, fathers. But Daravi is a place of extraordinary contrasts. It is an embryonic city, humming with human energy and determination. And it offers economic migrants the chance of a job. And it makes me begin to question why we have all this health and safety in my country. Living here has been nothing like I expected. She's laughing. Both of them are laughing because I'm useless. My food's been manhandled by eight people now. I keep thinking, come on, all these people, then I remember there were 21 people who live in this house, so that's you. This is, you know, so we're a small portion of the family. People here are happy, welcoming and hugely proud of where they live. I feel very relaxed, very welcome. I never thought I'd say it, but I have enjoyed my time here. Hi. I'm exhausted. I'm, I've, got, I've lost my voice again. Uh, second chest infection. In two weeks. And... Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting healthy. But it's, um, I have really mixed feelings about leaving this place, leaving these people here, because, you know, um, 
think there's a lot I can take home. Kumbawada, especially, has taught me lessons about living a low-impact, sustainable life with everything you need on your doorstep, about how space can be multifunctional and shared, that pride of place and community create safe neighbourhoods. Yeah, I thought it might be rougher. I thought it might be more criminal. I thought it, I thought it might be more... Uh, less organised and far more chaotic and rough. But it's the opposite of those things. It's fine and rather beautifully grained. Hi. Hi. How are you? All right. Hi. The only reason this is, can be called a slum is because it doesn't have great sanitation, doesn't have great health, doesn't have fantastic education. It's good enough. And hygiene isn't good, but, but that could all be changed. That could all be you know, put in. That's the frustrating thing. It's clear that improving this place would be far more beneficial to the people here than redeveloping it, and that if only these communities could galvanise themselves, there's a chance they'll survive with a better standard of living and just as good a quality of life. What have we got wrong that they've got right? I kind of think we've spent the last 60 years since the war pursuing the material at the expense of pursuing happiness. Not that the material is necessarily bad, but that actually the important thing is to be happy. And these people have a magic knack of being happy. Come through. It's a tour. It's a tour of the slum. It's a tour of Daravi. Nice. I think anybody who comes to this part of the world leaves with a sense of how little we really need from the West to make us happy. I hope that when the city moves in here, it just deals with the bad and does not destroy the good. Hi, how are you? You look very smart. Where's Monica? Is she, Is she here? Monica? Yes. I'm leaving. Yeah? I'm leaving. Uh -oh. I wanted to thank you very much. Yes, yes, yeah, um, yeah. It's what we do in the West. Yeah. Two kisses. Yes. Thank you very much for all your help yeah, and being such pleasure, a yes, fantastic yes. translator. Yeah. Thank you for letting yeah, me stay with you. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you again. Sanjay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uncle, thank you. And uh Krishna and good luck. Goodbye. Goodbye. I like that. No kissing, just lots of this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Granny. See you again, I hope. Yeah. Long life. Long life. Cheers. Bye-bye. Happy journey, Kevin. Thank you. I feel, I feel ready to go home. But I think whatever happens here with these people, whatever happens, the one thing that has to be preserved is that lovely... That warmth, that sort of sense of connection between all of them, that, that happiness thing. And um, I just pray God it, it does, you know. There must be at least half a dozen little rats play. They've all come out to play now. I'm not going to miss them.